So welcome everyone uh, to the DEF CON 2022. My name is Lucy and I'm the moderator for this session. And it's an honor for me to actually present Ben, Andrea and Mattia here and their talk, Quarkus Native Running on ARM V8. So I hand it over to you guys. And Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to mention for the audience, if you have any questions, please utilize the Q&A temp. Um, I'm sure uh, our dear speakers will have time to answer them. So to you. Thanks a lot. So welcome everyone to this uh, last session of DevConf 2022 for today. We are going to talk about Quarkus native running on RB8. It's going to be, of course, more than just technical stuff because we are uh, part of a an extended team that tries to build solution around edge computing and cloud native development. I will we will talk about that um, shortly. I hope you are enjoying DevConf. This year has been again uh, virtual, but still uh, it's always exciting. So um, let let us uh, thanks a lot the the whole DevConf entourage and, and um, the staff because they are they are fantastic amazing and and they supported us quite quite extensively okay so let's go uh through the presentation first um we will quickly introduce ourselves then i will give you an architectural overview so i will i will try to explain why we did this 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 uh we, we spent uh, such an effort to implement uh, automation around ARM V8 and, and um, cloud native development. Um, and then Matthias and Ben will discuss uh, Quarkus and why we have picked up that specific um, framework in Java and, and, and uh, based on Java programming language. And last but not least, portability and walkthrough on OpenShift. So it's going to be uh, we, we will show you also and demonstrate how it works and how can you you can use um, the whole environment we implemented. So quickly, um, let me first of all introduce myself. My name is Andrea Battaglia from Italy, um, and since the pandemic started, <laughs> we've been locked down. Um, I, I, I'm spending my time in in my hometown, so I'm very far south Italy. Um, I work for the Red Hat ecosystem. Um, so I look after uh, EMEA partners uh, when it's about complex solutions like, like edge computing and um, digital transformation. Um, and I'm also the, the Hackfest, uh, Red Hat Hackfest lead, which is the enterprise event behind the QIoT community, uh, which is actually the community where all these technical champions they join to create a solution that can be re reproducible and reusable. Ben? Hey, well, thanks, thanks, Andrea. Uh, good evening, DevConf. Um, so I'm a solution architect um, for Red Hat, uh, based in the land of windmills and tulips in the Netherlands. Um, I've been uh, involved with the Quarkus IoT community now for the last two years or so. Um, initially as a participant and now actually as a contributor as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit more about what we what we did in terms of containers. Thanks, Ben. And Mattia? Hi, everyone. I'm Mattia Magia. I'm principal consultant in Red Hat. I'm based on the Alps region, which is Switzerland and Austria. I specialize in OpenShift, or everything around cloud, all middleware stuff, the integration. I did also some Quarkus contribution. And uh, what I like uh, well, to do sport, recently Paleo training, you see on this picture, which I tried to escape from customer meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm joined the, um, the ACFEST or QAT community almost now three years ago, I guess. F time flying in pandemic, let's say. And so I really enjoy trying new things on the edge. So here we are trying to showcase what we have done so far during this year. Thanks, Mattia and Ben. Um, so let's go quickly through an architectural overview. Why would you need to run Quarkus Cloud uh, running native on, on ARM devices, ARM V8 devices, actually? Um, the QAT community um, will be discussed and um, we are looking forward to having you all in an, the next session tomorrow, actually. 
uh, around how to build solutions uh, empowered by communities. So we created this community because back in the days, um, we were trying to um, understand customer challenges and to address them beforehand. So create something uh, they call it on the in, at the enterprise level the eighty percent solution, something that could be used as a pitch, something that could be used uh, as a demo, as a POC, but that could be also uh, be the foundation of a real uh, customer uh, scenario, right? So, um, in many cases, you have the chance to make several several layers of your uh, distributed architecture talk to each other. But you definitely want to have um, some, some centralized automation and business logic on the data center plant, which means in turn, you want to have all the tools, the, uh, the processes and the pipelines to produce, roll out and distribute also your business logic, right? So the, the containerized uh, version of your, of your source code. And that's crucial because the business logic, of course, runs on the data center and runs in the production facility in, in, the, in the specific case, for example, of an edge manufacturing use case. Um, and the facility, of course, is made up of two completely different components. You have a, an edge server and an edge device and plus other sensors that could be um, available in, in your landscape. So we wanted to make sure that whatever kind of architecture, uh, CPU architecture was available at the edge, both device and server, we could be even um, um, able to produce containerized workload and then, of course, um, um, roll it out or so deploy it on uh, several edge layers. And this is what we have implemented, actually. So um, we've got some support from Intel in this case uh, for, for the, the, the edge layer, and, and, and I will never stop thanking them for, for the big support and collaboration. But the idea now is one single platform covering the entire landscape. So we have OpenShift content platform at the data center layer. Um, we have single node OpenShift for the, uh, the edge servers and Red for Edge, uh, or if, if you want to think about it in a, in a more upstream fashion, you can think of Fedora IoT as the upstream version of, of Red for Edge. But anyway, um, these platform have one single thing in common that that's uh, of, of interest of very high interest to us, uh, which is the the, the container technology no? uh, native um, in, in the open system. All of them, of course, are, ba are based on on well, um, So data center should take care of creating and managing the containerized uh, the container images, and of course, edge servers and edge devices are the one who actually um, take are, are the most important element of a distributed or geolocalized um, edge computing architecture. So this is bas basically the, um, the overview and on why we, we decided to go for that. And with this, I guess I hand over to Mattia. Mattia, do you want to share your screen or shall I keep going through the slides? Mattia, you are on mute. Are oh, you sharing? Okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Andreas, for the architecture. Um, I guess you can see the presenter view, hopefully. <laughs> so let's talk about supersonic, subatomic Java, uh, what it is. So the name is Quarkus. So Quarkus is the name is composed by two uh, parts. The quark, which is the elementary particle, that's why subatomic, and us, which is the hardest things in computer <coughs> science, so really stubborn to do the stuff. And that's why Quarkus was born. And there are several principles, but uh, we kind of summarize the key component about the Quarkus frameworks. First of all, is a framework of framework and with a mind or container first approach, which means if you want to work with a container, you need to kind of be a fast boot time and as well low memory footprint. And of course, we talk about scaling, how to scaling, it has to be really small footprint and so fit for several functionalities. So all the function and everything. And 
unified configuration. What it means? It means it allows you to work <laughs> with the classic imperative programming language, but as well with the active. So you kind of have the ability to combine those uh, way of working. And, and to make it quite easily because I'll, I'll allow you to, with several uh, utilities and predefined standard classes, allow you to really easily to combine those paradigm. And of course, it's a framework of framework, it's based on really community of standard, based on really a lot of extension, uh, in which are really kind of standard de facto like Hibernate, REST Easy, Vertex, all those framework that you are really familiar, it just matter to use it on your on Quarkus. And last but not least, is really a developer joy. Why is that? Because you know everything is uh, automated out of the box, like with zero configuration capability, and also the nice things about the library loading. You know, you don't need to anymore wait for Marv and Bid, everything. So everything, if you change something, automatically it's going to reload your. Um, your application and you in a blink and high you can see the change. And recently they introduced as well a developer UI where you can see all your framework, also a link to guideline in case you are still learning some extension. You can overview your properties as well the default one. And also you can if you implement it in a right way the unit test the integration test you can uh, launch continuously the testing under the hood meanwhile you implement your application. So in the end, Quarkus really uh, help you to faster the inner loop development. So fast, the fastest feedback, feedback loop you have and the faster you can refactor and test again. And, uh, and one of the important things about Quarkus as well is really Cube native uh, application which allow you to generate native executable code. Um, so what it means that allow you with some capability to implement in an easy way the native uh, implementation and so in a way that 80% of the work is built on build time and 20% of the work on at runtime. So let's have a look at the number. And all those numbers that we see on the top left corner is based on the start and time and the entry on the first request. And, and on, the, on, the, on the left side, we have just a simple REST application. And then on the right side top, we have a um, REST application with the CRUD capability. And you see the different memory footprint because when you add additional application, of course, you, you uh, increase a little bit the effort of the of the memory consumed by the application. But the next, the next things uh, that we want to show here is because uh, compared with other modern frameworks which use less initialization, Quarkus allow you to do all those less initialization at the build time. So because uh, time to first response is, is what matter for the, the end user, right? You want your application start up quickly as soon as possible. And in this way, you are able to scale up as well easily when the, the amount of request is increasing. Um, so um, just quickly analyze the, the, the below uh, diagram. You see that uh, for a, a simple REST application, a Quarkus application that runs on normal uh, hotspot VM, is kind of able to fit around uh, 73 meg megabytes of RAM, which is kind of the total um, memory included, everything used by the GVM, code cache, heap size, whatever. And, and, and believe me, it's quite impressive for a GVM application. But if you get uh, compiled in the application in native, is it able to start as well really, really less uh, footprint kind of around 12 megabyte of memory. So what it means, it can, we can deploy native Quarkus application and really 10 times more uh, like traditional cloud uh, Java application. So really in compare, like if you're familiar with Golang language, so really compare with the Golang binary capability. Okay, um, so pretty awesome. And that's why one of the choice we choose for uh, a ARM device or edge device because you require edge, uh, you require really small footprint to run on really small device. 
um, just a quick um, uh, overview about uh, imperative versus reactive. You have uh, two definitions of REST services. One is the uh, classic imperative REST services based on uh, REST easy. And the, the below one is how you can manage the same endpoint with the uh, reactive uh, uh, capability. Um, Quarkus uh, allow you to do both. Um, they provide great performance for blocky and unblocky endpoints, and as well provide additional uh, functionalities on top of the JAX RX um, um, standards. And to accomplish asynchronous communication, um, the React tags uh, is able to, you need to create um, a method with a unit type. A unit, think about like a streams, and uh, they can only emit either on a item, so your object, or a failure event. So, and of course, Quarks provide, allow you to create those type of instance easily. You don't need to, you know, understand how everything works how that works because based on the immunity api and in this way uh, with the reactive rest services uh, you are able to um, consume and serve more requests um, and when you're talking about edge device you should expect quite a lot uh, or requested um, yeah that's it for the end um, so for today's demo uh, when um, after the end, we just implemented um, um, a simple application, which is just REST endpoint. Uh, with just one uh, source code, you are able to compile for different uh, architecture. And we're going to show that uh, when you run uh, in a normal, your developer um, um, machine will be x86, but as well, uh, when we launch it on an uh, emulate environment or on a real edge device like Raspberry Pi, you will see the Archi ARM64 architecture. And that's it. I'll leave the, the talk to Ben. Thanks. Thanks, Mattia. Yeah, so, so like Mattia mentioned, um, and what makes Quarkus maybe um, interesting, uh, especially for your edge devices or IoT devices, is the small footprint and quick startup times. Now, how we can also in, improve things or, or what gives us interesting flexibility is when we start actually looking at containers, right? So when, when you think about containers and, and actually deploying your application using containers, it's a fairly simple uh, concept in terms of, I want to build something, my application, I want to ship it and I want to run it on my environment. So containers gives you benefits that you can actually um, redeploy some of your dependencies without reinstall, thinking of actually deploying a patch to your device. Um, I can do Delta updates, so I don't necessarily need to pull my full application all the time. Um, but it gives me that, that low overhead and flexibility of actually um, rolling out my application uh, towards our devices, right? So in, in essence, that this gives us that portability or that promise of portability. However, you might ask, well, now, does it really give us portability? Uh, especially when we start dealing with or thinking about different uh, types of architectures, right? So in, in our scenario, um, we wanted to um, deploy our, our containers running on a Raspberry Pi, for example. So to do that, we need to start looking at different options of, well, how can we actually um, achieve that to, to build a container for, for uh, in this case, an uh, ARMv8 um, architecture? So there are multiple different approaches that you could decide to, to take um, to, to get to that point, right? Um, so one option could be that you actually use dedicated build VMs. And I mean, this is still um, probably one of the recommendations from Graal VM, right? Is that we create a, a virtual machine, we run our build in there and, and create our, our um, actual container. However, thinking from a developer perspective, that can be a bit cumbersome. I mean, personally, I don't necessarily like running um, virtual machines on my, on, my, on my laptop. 
if I can avoid it. Um, also, especially if you think about um, actually automating the process, then a virtual machine becomes a bit, bit heavy, in my, in my opinion. Also, a, a different approach could be to actually have architecture-specific uh, Kubernetes clusters. So if I've got a, a ARM Kubernetes cluster, yes, I can build containers for ARM there. However, that means, well, I might need to have a specific type of cluster for each type of architecture that I, I need to uh, create images for, right? Another approach could be that you could think of, of cross-compilation. Now, this, this looks like a very interesting option. Um, since I can um, essentially create a binary for different architectures um, from an x86 machine. Um, but this also depends a lot on the type of framework that you are using and the type of, of language um, that you need to compile. So, for example, if you do something in C, that might be more straightforward to do compared to actually doing a Graal VM native compilation for Quarkus, right? And finally, there's also the option to actually build on your device. So think of a farm of Raspberry Pis, for example. Now, in concept and in gig factor, that sounds cool. However, a Raspberry Pi just does not have the horsepower to actually um, do a proper build or proper native build, right? You might sit there for days. However, there's another option, right? Um, and this is one that we've explored in the, in the Quarkus IoT community. Um, so about a year and a half ago, um, I found this uh, uh, project on GitHub called MultiArch, or MultiArch, um, that um, started using um, uh, essentially QMU uh, components to help you to run containers on different architectures. Now, this makes use of a, a component in the kernel, um, basically allowing you to run uh, miscellaneous binary formats. Um, and this sort of is what, what I'm trying to say with this whole reference to Star Trek and the universal translator, right? So typically when I need to identify a new language, I need uh, some sort of uh, snippet from this language and then interpret what uh, type of language that is. Now this uh, this component in the kernel allows you to essentially execute a arbitrary or a um, yeah arbitrary binary format right for different uh, uh, architectures for example. So in essence how that works there's some sort of magic um, identifier um, that this, this component would pick up and you can specify a specific interpreter um, when that uh, is, is identified. So in our case, um, where this comes in useful is that if I pick up that my, my binary that I'm trying to run is for, for ARM v8, um, I can actually tell it to um, use QMU um, to actually execute this binary. And what that would do then is only um, emulate the, the actual CPU. Uh, so it's, it's a lot less overhead than um, a full virtualization where I need to do the whole stack um, of, of from my hardware layer all, all the way to, to CPU level. I'm just actually translating those instructions. And this is done with a, with a user space uh, queue uh, MU component. So based on this, um, we actually created a, a set of um, standard standardized containers that um, embeds uh, the, these QMU static binaries inside the, the container. And um, we built a, a set of components that, that actually allow us to um, uh, create a native native builder using RAL VM um, and and Ma a Maven flavor as well, and then um, together with that, a, a, a UBI based runtime image that actually allows us to to embed our, our application binaries. All right, so so the way that that works then is that um, 
essentially when when I'm executing a a ARM V8 container on an x86 uh, machine, um, that CPU will be emulated um, to, to make sure that I can actually execute that container. So that emulation happens inside the container itself, which gives us some nice flexibility. Um, so thinking about how this, this could be used, I mean, I, I like bringing, uh, always thinking of a developer workflow, developer experience um, of how these building blocks uh, can actually be used in a real world environment. And especially if we think about um, developing applications using containers, um, it makes sense to actually add this capability inside your, your container environment itself, right? Think about, I want to, uh, build a, 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 or use my existing workflow that developers are familiar with to build for different architectures, run my, my test suites against that, and then um, actually deploy ev eventually to your device. <clears throat> so to, to sort of show how these blocks would fit together, Essentially, what, what we need to tell um, OpenShift um, or the nodes in OpenShift is um, that when we receive that magic um, uh, identifier for a specific uh, binary, that we need to um, use or initiate um, the, the emulator within the containers, right? So there's this component. Um, that actually basically just runs on, on each node and says, well, this is the interpreter to use when you, when you see this, this instruction, essentially. Um, then we, stepping through, through our, our process, we can follow a normal sort of um, CI uh, style process where we actually um, use our multi-arc um, uh, builder images in, as part of our pipeline where we, can assemble um, our, our, our uh, container um, or build our application either native or using Maven, for example, and then inject that um, into a runtime image that we can then execute our environment. But <laughs> we need to see some proof. So I will show you, um, or I'll walk you through um, what I've uh, created on OpenShift, um, just to give you an idea of, of what this means, right? And how this, this can all fit together. And after that, uh, Mattia will show us that this actually runs on a Raspberry Pi as well, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, um, to kick it off, well, first we need to prep our environment um, or our our, um, our OpenShift nodes to tell it that we register this miscellaneous binary format interpreter. Now, to do that, um, <clears throat> as part of our, our GitHub repos, there's a we create a daemon set, um, which basically run makes sure that a certain command runs on each of the nodes in the cluster. So this is a very simple, um, simple pod that runs. Um, I can show you in some of the logs and all that that does is basically specifying uh, which interpreter uh, to use for a specific architecture type, right? So that, that sets the scene, call it that, or preps your environment to um, enable it to run these uh, multi-arc containers. Then we've also created a, a set of um, uh, set of, of tasks for our for our Tekton pipelines. Essentially, um, there we've I've created two um, uh, tasks. Basically, one that does a normal Maven build. Um, but for a different architecture, in this case, ARM v8, and also a, a task that does a native build. So the only, only different thing for this task compared to a standard Maven task 
is that we actually base it on our uh, multi-arc Maven image, right? Um, and in this task, we also cache some of the, our Maven repos that we can actually speed up our builds a little bit, right? That we don't have to download from, from Maven all the time. For the native, um, for the native task, we also um, have a sort of two-step build process. So our first step, actually make sure that we actually download all our, our Maven um, dependencies locally so that we can actually use that during our native build uh, process. And using our, our multi-arc builder image, essentially. Um, and then we run a native build. Right, so it's very should be very familiar to those that know Quarkus, um, similar type of parameters that we pass. Now, putting this together in a simple um, pipeline, I created two of these. Um, I'm not going to run it um, during the session because, I mean, it does take a little bit of time. Um, but essentially, what what this does is just a simple git clone. It does a build and creates an image for us, All right? So it's fairly, fairly simple. Now, just to give you indication of um, how long these things run in, in pure, in all transparency. So for the Maven build, once, we, once we've actually um, uh, cached our dependencies, um, the build for the simple application takes about three minutes. Um, and if we look at our native one, it's a bit slower, right? So it's about 25 minutes in this case. Um, I mean, this is without optimization and this is running on my Intel NUC sitting in my attic, right? So, I mean, there could be some performance improvements in this, right? Now, when we actually, um, so part of this pipeline also created the, the simple application so just showing you um, some of the, the workloads or the pods that we've, we've created. Um, so it's a fairly simple uh, of deploy a version of the normal one and a version of the native build. So if we look at the, maybe the, some of the memory usage, um, in this case, it's been running for from probably a week or two, sitting at about uh, 500 megs for the for the for the Java flavor. Um, however, looking at the the native one, that one is a lot leaner on our uh, our resource utilization, right? Now, also, if we look at the startup times for these, um, this is still quite quick for our our native uh, container, all right? Now, maybe just to prove that we actually, uh, actually can call our service. So this is our native endpoint. If I actually put the endpoint end in, let's zoom a little bit. So now I can actually, based on that test application that Matthias showed, um, I can actually show that I'm running on uh, Arch uh, 64, right? Which is ARM V8. However, it might also be interesting to um, actually show um, which processes are running. So I've got a little script and uh, Mattia will probably do something similar on, on the Pi just to prove a point, right? So if we run this, we can actually now see inside this container, um, we've got uh, the QMU uh, components running. So that's simulating or, or emulating our, our CPU for us to make sure that we actually can execute this on our x86 cluster. 
And with that, I think over to you, Mattia. To... Thanks. Thanks, man. It was really nice. Uh, let me show now if it works as expected on the Pi. Can you see the screen, the terminals? Yes, okay. a little bit small. Small? Okay, let's increase more. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, we have two tab here. One, uh, we have the JVM um, container, which is pushed uh, on the QAIO. And uh, on the right side, we have the Natty one. So we can launch. Oh, of course, we are on the Pi. First of all, <laughs> let me proof that we are on the Pi. Arc 64. Okay. And so then I launch the GF, GVM one, I will launch the native one. You see the native one is quite fast. You see the time is faster than the nuke of Ben, <laughs> my pie. And then uh, we see here the Java one, it took five seconds. Look the difference, really impressive. Um, we see we have two container, native one, GVM one. Uh, we see under the pros, really low memory footprint. We have around uh, here around 70 megabytes, here around 30 megabytes for the native one. Um, let's check. Um, because our two containers running on Pi, I expose a different port. The native one is on the 8080, 8081. Um, hello. Local host, sorry. You see, and then uh, we can check as well the GM, GBM one. And you see, it's a little bit slower, but the native one is really faster. Um, so, to prove that we are not in a emulate environment, uh, let me get the command that then prepared for me. Uh, let's log in to the one of the container. Okay. And launch the command. You see here, we are really using the ARC 64 JDK. It's pretty awesome, right? Um, so that's the proof that all the multi-ARC stuff, it works as expected. And the Nanti wave is really impressive performance on the on an edge device. In this case, we are on the Raspberry Pi 3. Yeah, maybe just to reiterate there is that when it actually runs on the device, it's not emulated at all. Exactly. Right? So it's so it's only emulated when we're actually running on a different uh, architecture host, call it that, which is yeah. nice. Exactly, as, as we are using QAMU for both the uh, compiler image and the workload image, the one that, that we deploy on the, um, on the production side, right? So that's... That's the big difference. So QMO uh, jumps in only if the CPU architecture we are trying to use is different from the real physical CPU architecture underneath. So that's that's where it comes into play. Thanks, guys. Uh, I just wanted to summarize again. Um, we've started with Quarkus Native on an ARM V8 device simply because technically speaking, it's awesome right the work we are trying to do and the goals we are trying to achieve here as ben correctly said is creating pipelines that automate the generation and distribution of the workload across a distributed environment and that fits brilliantly into a whatever kind of edge computing use case and that helps of course 
anytime you have to deal with um, uh, these homogeneous um, CPU architectures. Another thing that it's worth to mention is that we are not reinventing the wheel, right? Um, we started two years ago using the virtual machine and <laughs> I was compiling the, the um, um, gra the uh, Quarkus native images on, on the virtual machine on my uh, host at home, right? Not, not on a laptop, it was a real uh, powerful enough computer. Um, and then, then Ben and came up with this with this idea and implemented this this stuff. And what we are seeing now is that we are able to build POC for each and every use case because whatever kind of hardware you put underneath, whatever kind of CPU architecture you have to deal with, we always have the opportunity to put some pipelines, native pipelines, and and deal with the the tasks we we have to uh, complete. Um, and not reinventing the wheel also because so far the cross compiling feature, uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but as far as I know, as I know, the cross compiling feature is still missing in, um, in Graal VM. So that's why we're kind of supporting as a counterpart, the brilliant and fantastic job, the guys from the workers, um, uh, workers engineering team are doing with the workers images, right? We are not integrated. We are parallel on a parallel um, uh, work stream trying to achieve tasks that are not covered by the standard tools belonging to the workers universe. So now um, we will stay a bit more in case people, they want to have a technical conversation or ask specific questions after the session is over. But let me, um, and please feel, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section or to write something in the chat. We are more than happy to, uh, to interact with you all. Um, it's time almost to close the session, but before we do that, let us invite you to join the QIoT project. So QIoT could, be, could sound weird. Uh, we do definitely much more than Quarkus for IoT. Um, in that community, we try to build pieces that could be integrated in other projects, could be useful for customer project or partner project, whatever, or just to have fun. We play with Raspberry Pis, we play with technology powered by Intel, so enterprise edge devices. We played with several uh, sensors and sensor boards, and we are going to play with more and more um, devices as, as far as the CPU shortage allows us to. To, to buy small devices, of course, 64 bit native for a fair price, of course. Um, so we have a landing page. You can have a look at our landing page, our blog hosted by GitHub pages to have a look at the use case and the PSTs we have already implemented, the technologies we used. Um, and last but not least, we have a quite, quite extensive set of projects and small components because our POCs are distributed across several layers. So you have several Quarkus native applications running on each and every layer. We use enterprise technologies. We, don't, we are not trying to use upstream technologies because it's not worth it as we propose this as a source of reusable components. And last but not least, <clears throat> we make extensive use of several um, technologies that are running natively on container technology, like uh, container platforms like OpenShift. We have, I guess, a question here from Jan. He says, uh, guys, I'm gonna read it um, for, oh, Lucy, do you want to jump in here? Um, it's up to you, basically. Um, or I My pleasure, even... be our guest. All right, or even Jan, if you would like to ask the question live, uh, just click uh, share audio and video and I can kick you in. That's also an option. Okay, I don't see any ask right now, so I'm gonna read. Um, I want to handle a bunch of 48 uh, microcontrollers, especially 32 with uh, Ethernet, uh, with a device like Raspberry Pi. Can I run Quarkus native for simple uh, REST client, REST API application on it? 
Okay, would question. you like to reply? Hmm? This is yours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the the demo that I showed before, the which was just a simple REST client or REST uh, service in our client, the client was just card. Uh, it was running natively in the ARM device on a Raspberry Pi. So you could do that. And as you could see from, from Matthias' demo, um, it actually takes 8, in eight so just zero 08, 8 milliseconds. I can share that. again if you want. Uh, yeah, please, Matthias. Oh, um, so eight <laughs> milliseconds to start up and only 30 megs of memory. Of course, the amount of resources used by the applications on Ben's demo, so single node open shift on an Intel NAC 10th gen was completely different because the, the, the application then is surrounded by the container technology that of course uses, makes use of additional resources. Please, Matthias. Yeah, so here we have the native one. Then we have the JVM one. With Can you zoom maybe in. zoom in just a bit more? Yeah, maybe just to add a little bit to that, um, especially when, you, when you're building native applications, it also depends on the type of libraries that you are requiring in your, in your application. Um, because not all of them are necessarily uh, support native compilation. Um, there might be some workarounds uh, or some some ways around that, uh, but that's also just something to take into account when you start uh, building uh, or trying to control microcontrollers, for example. Yeah, so beware. Um, uh, as Ben said, just use try not to use libraries from outside the Quarkus universe. Quarkus mm -hmm. universe has Ton, a, a myriad of libraries and you can definitely find the one that suits your your needs um then there was another question i guess i mentioned already um the, the minimum uh, what's the oldest raspberry pi that can be supported so to run natively quarkus must run on a 64-bit capable or potentially native CPU. So the minimum is Raspberry Pi 3B plus, because that uh, supports um, ARM 64, uh, ARC 64 natively, but then beware, you have to switch uh, that on uh, through some, some configuration in the, in the boot section of your operating system. Uh, we kindly recommend to use Fedora IoT for that, no, definitely. Um, and of course, we have um, uh, some Fedora IoT images ready to be flashed on the SD card for your Raspberry Pi. We have the kickstart file ready to be used if you want to compile uh, the operating system images so you can experience the amazing, annoying part of building the, container, the OS image for the SD card of, or on your own, because that's going to be for ARM64, and then you have to use some kind of emulation um, underneath Anaconda to build that image. So could be annoying. Use our image, it's, you can make it easily. Mm. Yeah, so try uh, the, the multi-arc image builder with the Quarkus, as we did actually for this demo, because otherwise that would take much longer, with the uh, basic Quarkus quick starts. We used actually the Hello World Quick Start. Uh, go to Ben's repo or have a look at our repos where you find the word edge in the repo name because we use a special naming convention to define whether the application should run on the data center, factory, or edge. Okay, so you go to the edge and you can see that there are several Docker, um, uh, Docker files that use uh, standard builders for standard Java the Quarkus image builders for the Quarkus native uh, x86 and our multi-arc builder for um, ARM, ARM V8. Of course, you can you can um, use standard, as Ben said, standard Java and also uh, compile your Java for ARM V8 directly on a Raspberry Pi. I mean, that's simple Java takes uh, no resources almost. 
the problem is mainly is the, with, with the native compilation that takes quite a huge amount of resources. Okay, you have to, and also emulating, you have to think of a minimum requirement of five, five to six, up to whatever, depending on how many modules from the Workers University you are putting into your application. More than okay. welcome. I guess we can uh, mention tomorrow, Andrea, that we have uh, yeah, additional yeah, events. Let me, yeah, advertise again. Tomorrow we are um, presenting into another session uh, that's uh, about the community mm -hmm. we are driving. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't invite more, but our colleagues uh, um, will join anyway, not as a speaker. Uh, so you will have the chance to ask um, or to interact with uh some of the most esteemed members of this community which is again contributed not just by red Hat test, but also people from the part and people who participated in the event people from outside the whole red Hat partner ecosystem or customer ecosystem people that have a uh, that that have a huge knowledge or understanding or expertise in the iot world and that for example pushed mati and myself for example to talk about security and distributed certificates when it's about um connecting devices so um or, or, or with the edge server so that it's kind of interesting to see and they are also interesting and funny people to talk to uh with this i guess we are done lucy yeah Let and just... i thank you so much for the presentation and for the demo uh it was really interesting and a uh, great segue actually to tomorrow and um, your session uh, will be around noon, but definitely we start from the morning, uh, again at like 9 a.m. Uh, Defcon is not over. Uh, we still have one more day to go, and I'm great. Uh, I'm grateful that you actually uh, closed today's um, session room five with this amazing presentation. So I thank you all. For Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone. Here. Thanks Lucy. And happy yeah, Defcon. Yeah, happy Defcon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Bye-bye. Happy death. Bye. Uh, ciao, ciao.